Is green a favorite color of yours, Everett? Is I didn't uh, I didn't really include it in this presentation because it was just getting a little long. But uh, I was <laughs> collecting portraits of moss during my entire trip, <laughs> and I've been moss for Halloween or a stone eater for Halloween for the last like three years. <laughs> oh, nice! Did you just use the artificial moss you can buy from Hobby Lobby? I I sustainably harvest a little bit here and there. And, uh, I collected a bunch when I was in Iceland too to make this tea, um, which was really delightful. Tell me. Yeah, let's let's do it. All right. Well, welcome everyone. My name is Eric. I'm Travis. And this is our webinar with Everett Killian, Killian about their trip to Iceland and bike packing and moss. <laughs> <laughs> We also wanted to thank our sponsors, Tandem Bicycle. Mm. Good coffee. Coffee in Portland. Biscuits. Chips worldwide. Yeah. Good coffee and biscuits. If you're in the Portland area, come by their store and, and pick up some. They'll grind it fresh right there. It smells delicious in there. <laughs> um, so Everett, we'd love for you to introduce yourself and tell us all about Iceland. Sure. Um, as mentioned, my name is Everett, and um, I'm coming to you from... Uh, just south of the other Portland um, in Oregon. And um, I just moved here to Eugene um, about a week before I left for my trip. So uh, I'm kind of just getting settled here and have um, really enjoyed getting to know this area and kind of just jumped right in. Uh, I think I was back in the United States for about three hours before I ended up in Southern Oregon at the board retreat for the Oregon Timber Trail. Uh, so it's really just kind of been one thing after the other, but it's great. Um, should I just go ahead and dive in? Yeah, I would say dive in. And we just want to let folks know that if you have questions throughout the presentation, you can just throw that into chat um, and we will be able to answer or Everett will be able to answer those questions for you. Yeah. And otherwise, we'll uh, have questions at the end as well. But we'll try to address reasonable questions like within the context of the discussion, right, right as they're being uh, entered. Yeah, and um, yeah, if folks have questions, I'll try to catch some of them as we go. Um, it's kind of a long trip, so uh, I'll, I guess I'll go ahead and get started. Um, but yeah, my name is Everett, and um, I am a cyclist and a curator, and um, I've kind of found a way to bring those things together in my life in some very interesting ways, especially over the last decade or so. Um, and I've been putting together these uh, expedition exhibitions or exhibition expeditions. It really varies depending upon how I remember to say it, but um, where I take different um, like art installations out in the outdoors or phenomena or points of interest. And I like to link them together and kind of create a route the same way that I would do an exhibition. Um, so this route um, is uh, formatted in that way as well. So I'll go ahead and start this up uh, and share my screen. Let's see. I am uh, presenting using a different format that I've used in the past. So uh, thank you for your patience. And uh, let's see, this works. Great. Um, can folks see that okay? Yes. There we are. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're going. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, I. Uh, decided to call the project Water Weather Willingness uh, because we crossed a lot of ferries. It is a very uh, moist atmosphere out in Iceland. There is water absolutely everywhere. I don't think that I have ever traveled with only one water bottle before, but here we are. <laughs> um, luckily there's enough streams and if you carry a filter, you can kind of just scoop and sip uh, pretty much the whole way. Um, and yeah, the weather is its own character um, in this country. It kind of, you kind of start to befriend it and talk to it, shout at it, um, which a lot of cyclists, especially if you're a touring cyclist, you're probably used to that. Um, so yeah. Um, so I have a, a way of planning routes that is uh, a, a little 
uh, over the top, maybe. Um, I kind of create these like almost CSI level uh, information boards that I take up like a whole wall in my apartment or my office. Um, and I put up every different type of map that I think that I'll be using or referencing during the trip and kind of just like to sit with it and live with it for a while. Um, it's nice to be able to kind of just like walk by these things so that uh, when you're actually out there and you're on route, you kind of have this like reference point, at least for me in the back of my head where I'm like, oh, OK, I'm at this bend in the uh, fjord or I'm crossing over this part of the glacier and I can kind of see it in my head, which makes me just have a little bit more comfort and a sense of safety while I'm out um, in unpredictable situations, uh, calculated uh, situations. And so uh, this route started off like this. So this is my um, old apartment in Santa Cruz, um, where I was living prior to moving here to Oregon. And uh, so this is kind of the board in the background here. And I do a lot of research for projects like this. And I'm a huge nerd. Like I mentioned, I'm a curator by trade. So I like to um, do a lot of like background, looking into interesting places to go and to visit. I've done a couple of different um, uh, exhibition expeditions. Uh, over on the left here is, uh, you'll see this kind of like spiral jetty, it is an art installation by um, Robert Smithson um, that a friend of mine and I did around the Great Salt Lake. We basically found all these different outdoor installations and made a map and took a week kind of like uh, hunting down these art installations in the middle of nowhere. And it was a really nice experience. Um, did this uh, artist residency in Joshua Tree. So I rode from Los Angeles out to Joshua Tree to stay in this little uh, hatch, space hatch uh, situation. It was kind of like this little artist colony out in the middle of the desert. Um, so I kind of followed a similar format that I've done in the past for this. And so these are uh, just some of the books that I use to reference this. It's kind of a mixture of um, contemporary art books and poetry. Um, Eileen Miles is one of my favorite poets um, and her work kind of has a lot of intersections with um, this artist named Ronnie Horn, um, whose uh, installation, The Library of Water is what I based this entire route on. Um, I think there's, yeah, her books in there too. And if anybody's interested in any of these books, I'm happy to send some links. Um, so this is the background map for the Library of Water. Um, it's a series of uh, columns of water that were from core samples taken from uh, Iceland's five major glaciers. So you can kind of see um, where those samples were taken or where these orange bits are, and they correspond with each of these uh, columns here. So each region has a different kind of sediment, and I'll talk about that a little bit later uh, when we get to the Library of Water in Um So yeah, I was very interested in uh, Ronnie's uh, kind of approach to the weather. Uh, she was visiting Iceland in the 70s and kind of became an artist in residence there for decades and decades. Uh, worked a lot with the community and uh, was really interested in the idea of this like um, archive of water as this kind of collective self-portrait of Iceland um, as a country, as a people. Um, and so I made the route based off of as many of these uh, samples as I could put along my route and also visiting a lot of other different artist spaces and collectives and just like different interesting things um, that you can find when you are on a bike out in the middle of nowhere. Well, it's not in the middle of nowhere. Um, so this is the route. Um, I kind of put it together using some pre-existing routes, um, some recommendations from some friends. Um, I did this project as part of um, a project called We Got Next. I'll talk a little bit about that later. But uh, yeah, the route was roughly just under 1,500 miles, um, even though we were doing everything in kilometers. I, it's doing a lot of math in my head, but for some reason still did the route in miles. I don't know why. Um, but yeah, this route is available um, on Ride with GPS. Uh, it's just the navigation system that I found to be the easiest for me to use and edit on the go and to share with people. So that's the one that I have been using for this trip. 
um, I had a lot of support in putting together this route, which I'm really, really grateful for. Uh, so here's the route again, and it's kind of broken up between some routes that I found on bikepacking.com, which some of you may or may not be familiar with, is um, a website where you can go and find lots of different uh, mixed terrain routes um, from single track trails to uh, gravel roads and everything in between. And so this route is made up of um, the West Yards Way, which is this section, it kind of looks like a ginger root, just like popping off the side of the, the country up in the north. Um, and it connects the West Yards Way with uh, the Witch of the West, which is a subsection of the West Yards. It's some of the most remote area um, in the country. So there tends to be less people since it's a little bit further away from like Reykjavik, Maine. Um, and there are there aren't giant buses that go there. Um, it's just a series of like small vans um, that kind of shuttle people around that area. So it's beautiful. Um, I have a feeling that within the next five years, it's going to be extremely crowded. Um, but we all love to see beautiful things. So we'll, we'll figure a way to kind of mitigate that. It was an ongoing theme, actually, for the trip as well as kind of seeing how the country balances its two major industries, uh, which are um, steel processing and, or sorry, aluminum processing and tourism, uh, which are kind of at odds with one another. And we can kind of talk about that a little bit later. But yeah, um, kind of linking together these routes. And then uh, fortunately I was able to link up with Chris Burkhart, who's the one who designed uh, the West Yards Way. And he gave a lot of guidance into where to go, where not to go. I did an alternate version of the divide um, that goes straight south from Akureyri uh, down the split, as opposed to kind of going through the actual uh, continental divide, which is on the Eurasian plate and the American plate, which is kind of interesting too, because Iceland itself is kind of like toggling back and forth between a lot of uh, heavy American influence and European influence, but it's kind of its own uh, own spice in the middle there. Um, well, spice is probably not the right word because the food is quite bland, but briny. And I like briny. Uh, if you like pickled things and fish, this is your place. Um, and so, as I mentioned before, this project um, was sponsored by this organization called We Got Next. And We Got Next amplifies individual stories of adventure and activism from communities that have been unrepresented in outdoor and environmental spaces. Um, they found me through this organization called Radical Adventure Writers, which is um, an outdoor uh, nonprofit and uh, organization that hosted rides and summits and all kinds of workshops and things like that with these lovely people who you see up here. Um, we started in 2017 and I stepped back from leadership of that organization in 2020 um, just to kind of work on some other projects and bring in some some fresh eyes, some fresh blood. Um, and so they were kind enough to cover uh, most of my costs for this trip, which is why I was able to take three months and um, actually spend a good amount of time um, going through Iceland and um, meeting with family and interviewing artists and um, all kinds of fun stuff. So thank you, Steve, and we got next. Y'all are amazing. Uh, but unfortunately, I had a couple of setbacks. Um, I had planned the route. I had started planning it in 2020 and as part of this, um, with this organization and uh, have been planning it through the pandemic, post-pandemic. I've been kind of like looking forward to this for a long time. And uh, right in the thick of training, I was gonna leave in um, June of 2022, um, except a, this lovely wall here that you see in the bottom center, um, 500 pound wall fell on me and essentially folded my body in half. Um, and so I had to postpone my trip. <laughs> Um, but thankfully I had some really, really good support with physical therapists and I was able to, um, get back on the bike and start training again and was able to set off, um, almost a year later. I think I started walking again in 
July, August, um, and I left for this trip in early June of this last year, 2023. So this is my, uh, this is the entire contents of my bicycle. Um, I am in my garage here in Eugene. I moved everything up here, uh, was here for a few days, and then packed up my bike, rode to the train station in Eugene, and took the train to Portland, where I stayed with my cousin for an evening, um, and then headed off on a plane the next day. So in my kit, I've got a very kind of basic but pretty minimal kit. I don't like to bring a lot of stuff because the more stuff I have, the more stuff I'll lose on the trip. Um, I've been doing this for God, almost two decades at this point. So I've kind of like narrowed things down over the years. So you've got your waterproof socks, two pairs of wool socks. Basically, it's two pairs of wool everything. So t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, one pair of pants, you know, kind of the deal. Um, I did this trip with my very, very, very dear friend, Tessa Holes, uh, who is um, actually uh, launching her new book this uh, winter into the spring called Feeding Ghosts. And so this was kind of her big hurrah that she was done with the book. But unfortunately, as uh, the publishing world, uh, if you've ever been involved with that before, uh, it gets messy. So she ended up having to find uh, coffee shops and culture centers and borrow computers <laughs> and do a lot of last minute edits that ended up being really challenging. But we each brought our own tent, uh, even though we ended up just using mine the entire time because it was pretty cold. And so you get a lot more body heat if you've got two bodies in the same tent. So this is kind of the kit here. Um, it didn't really get above like 60 degrees the whole time that we were out there. And so um, lots of different layers because when you're riding, it's really, really windy. So you're like really, really pushing hard and you're getting really sweaty. So that's why the wool is super, super helpful. And I also have synthetic downs. Um, just as it is, there's just so much moisture. Um, once you get wet, you would never get dry if you're wearing cotton or synthetics. And uh, my skin doesn't like that. So uh, that's the that's the kit. Um, I flew out in late June, like just after the solstice. Um, I have family who lives in Reykjavik. These are my cousins in the middle here, Fiona and Alex. Um, fly into the airport, which is like an hour south of the city of Reykjavik. If you've been to Iceland, a lot of people have, uh, it's kind of a bizarre uh, one hour bus ride uh, from the airport to like anywhere really. Um, so the day that I landed was also the day that the most recent eruption occurred. There was another one that actually um, set off yesterday or the day before. Um, which is like a two mile long rift um, that they had been expecting for a long time. And it's much bigger than this one that you see kind of like at the end of the road. But this photo is taken um, just right outside my cousin's apartment. And you can see the volcanic activity just in the distance. Um, it doesn't affect the people of the city uh, in terms of like lava flow or anything like that, but it is the off gassing of the chemicals that can be pretty gnarly. So there's a lot of uh, air alerts um, and especially the day that we left. So the day that I got there, uh, the plane ar like arrived at seven in the morning and I couldn't really check into my hostel until four in the afternoon. So I had this giant box, this bike box that I was kind of like lugging around. I was able to ditch it somewhere with a nice coffee shop owner. Um, met, met up with cousins, uh, went to a bunch of different galleries and art museums. I was so tired. I don't think, I didn't sleep on the plane, so I <laughs> slept in like 24 or 48 hours. Um, so I was pretty tired, uh, just kind of getting going. And I got there a little bit before Tessa um, arrived. So I was able to check out, this is like an art installation and some like alley with some artists who brought some uh, pieces out into the highlands to do a photo show. Over on the left is like some pretty typical architecture for, um, for Iceland. There's a lot of like metal side siding and things like that. It's like a giant fishing village, but an uh, entire country. Uh, it's interesting. It's very, in a lot of places, uh, structurally square. 
this is my friend Hessa here. When she arrived, unfortunately, um, when TSA took her bike out of the box, uh, it opened up the protector that was covering her chain ring. She had just ridden across the, um, the Yukon on this bike in Alaska and came straight from there working on a project with the Arctic Wildlife Refuge. And so her bike was already a little, had already seen quite a few miles and the chain ring just sheared off like a full four teeth. So we were just panicking because we were supposed to leave in like the next morning. Um, like running around the city, it's very hard to find a bike shop um, in Iceland, honestly. Um, a lot of them are rentals and the ones that aren't rentals um, are just these like giant um, kind of like sports authority type uh, places that are in the suburbs of the city. Um, and once you're outside of town, it's uh, friends of friends, just call people who uh, might have some bike tools and uh, folks will help you out. But yeah, that was uh, our first mechanical of the trip. Um, and for some reason, chain rings uh, haunted us the entire time. And heading out of the city, um, it took a while for us to actually just like get out of town. There's a great network of trails that head out of Reykjavik proper. Um, there's all these like really neat playgrounds with zip lines and things like in every city, every city, every town has an outdoor playground, it's free to the public, um, a pool with uh, a hot, hot pots, um, and like recreational centers. It's uh, really neat to see the priority, like people prioritizing outdoor recreation and activity. Um, but our first day out, there was a, a it wasn't there in the morning when we left. It wasn't there when we checked the weather report the day before, but uh, as to be expected, the wind just kind of came out of nowhere and knocked us sideways. <laughs> um, this is the most intense wind I've ever experienced. So in the middle, this is uh, us laying in a ditch. <laughs> There's not really a whole lot to hide behind. It's pretty exposed. And um, we're like laying in a ditch to honestly catch our breath, um, have a little bit of a snack. That first day we ran into like seven other cyclists who were just like pushing their bikes on the main road trying to get out of the city. Um, the route that we put together uh, avoids as many paved roads as possible, um, but there is only one major road um, in the country, which is the ring road and it uh, or one major paved road. So it tends to have a lot of traffic. So we tried to avoid the ring road like the plague. Um, but the wind was blowing so hard, I don't know how well you can see it in this photo of my uh, cockpit handlebar situation, but it, uh, I was pushing so hard into the wind while I was riding that it actually turned my headset and it wasn't even loose. <laughs> uh, so I had to stop and kind of like reset everything on my headset. You can kind of see how it's like turned in like this weird way. It was like such a bizarre angle that my front wheel was at riding almost parallel to the ground um and we ended up having to uh, seek shelter in this like abandoned uh like uh box car um that was on a farm just off the road and we didn't want to it was it was getting to a point where it was unsafe for us to be outside um we couldn't really it's like the type of wind that like blows your mouth out and you can't really catch your breath even when you're standing still um so it's pretty it's, it's kind of spooky um so we found this place and we tried to get warm because that wind chill is really really cold and kind of tried to map out some options because we only ended up getting like 15 or 16 miles that first day and we had planned to do about 40 to 50 i think um but we did what was safe because that's what you should do. I was a, a cycling guide for a number of years. And so I always prioritize safety like uh, like the grandpa that I am. Uh, but thankfully, uh, the people who actually managed the farm, we left them a note with a rock on top uh, just so that they wouldn't be freaked out if they came by and found us like popping out of this shipping container in the morning. Um, and they ended up actually inviting us in and we uh, had coffee and we talked until like two or three in the morning. Um, by this point, it was still light outside at that time of day. Um, meanwhile, the parents uh, or the kids of the parents we were uh, staying with uh, had made these flight suits. I didn't take photos um, of the flight suits, but 
they're just like outside playing in the wind, these like tiny kids. And apparently they did it all the time, uh, flying each other like kites. It was wild. Um, so we finally made it to Borgamis, uh, which is kind of like finally out of the city, out of the suburbs, over the fjord, and we're heading toward the west fjords. So I'm kind of pointing to them at this point. Um, these photos, the sunset was probably around 12 o'clock at night, um, around there. So it's not necessarily like full midnight sun, but it's like sunset, like twilight for hours and hours and hours. Um, but by the time I left in September, it was getting dark at like 3.30 in the afternoon. There was snow on the ground. So things change quick. Uh, we had, because of the delay from the wind situation, uh, we had decided to stay in Borimis for the morning. We went to the pool and sauna to stretch out a bit, and we decided to try to catch the bus to um, Strikisonrush so that we could get back on track for our route. But um, it's very difficult to get your bike on a bus in Iceland, especially if you're heading toward the West Fjords, something that I did not know uh, earlier, because all the people that I had talked to were like, oh, you can put your bike under the bus, which is true, uh, but only if there's room, and there's very rarely room. Um, the buses run on the ring road itself, and so there's often um, people trying to avoid the wind by getting on the bus, so uh, it's kind of a... Uh, hit or miss kind of situation. So we didn't make the bus and uh, we just decided to keep riding and the wind died down the next morning. So things were much better. Um, this is heading north to Strykjusdomr where the library of water is. And uh, kind of this peak, you can see this like pointy guy over there um, is a uh, old um, dormant volcano area. Uh, this section of the country it is kind of like the flange to the west that's just under the west fjords um, was actually the um, location of uh, journey to the center of the earth a Jules Verne science fiction book like one of the earliest science fiction uh, books of its time uh, talks about this uh, German geologist who like almost basically kidnaps his son and takes him into the center of the world through a portal in a volcano in Iceland so um, I'm a big audiobook person and I decided to listen to that audiobook uh, while riding through here. And so it was interesting to get those fantastical descriptions while kind of looking through this landscape. Um, this is also along that route where we're having lunch is like tucked up behind that mountain there. But this is what most of the roads look like if they're paved um, off the ring road. So it's kind of nice. They're really small. There's not usually a whole lot of traffic. Um, and it's pretty, it pretty delightful. You can see that uh, I have a view of the library of health. So we made it to Skrikistromer. And where, what's the name of the hotel? Hotel Breifjörder. Breifjörder, I think. I'm, I'm working on it. Um, so we made it. We have a very cute little room here. Uh, very little, but it fits our massive bicycles <laughs> and uh, two beds. And the fun part is, you can see that uh, I have a view of the library of water right over there, but right there from my bed. So that was fun. Um, we finally made it to uh, Strikisomber, uh, which is where the library of water is. And um, I have been kind of reading about this project for a really long time. Um, this is one of the columns of water um, that was part of that glacial uh, core sample that I mentioned earlier. And uh, it's just kind of an interesting view to kind of walk through this space. Um, it's really fun. There is some other uh, curators getting a tour. Um, not a lot of people actually come to visit <laughs> this space, um, which I think is interesting. It's kind of just like there and um, I guess it's kind of a nerdy stop off, but um, I personally enjoyed it very much. Uh, so, long before Brian Horn started making work uh, really about this place, but also work as an artist in general, she came to Iceland in the 1970s and packed up her motorcycle. 
Everett, could you turn the volume up on these videos at all? Unfortunately, I don't think that I can turn up the volume um, on this end, but if you want to turn it up where you are, I apologize for the inconsistency. Work as an artist in general. She came to Iceland in the 1970s and packed up her motorcycle and rode all around the island camping in different places, really kind of getting a, a feel of the space just in a very open and exposed kind of way. A little bit like bike touring, a little bit, uh, but maybe just a tad less exhausting. <laughs> Um, and she came here to speak this moment and um, really loved this building. Uh, from the outside, it kind of looks like an Art Deco gas station um, slash lighthouse, which is how she describes it, which I think is fabulous. Um, but you can see it kind of looks out over onto the whole town here. And it actually looks out onto the town's actual lighthouse, which is way up there on the hill. But I'm here now. I've been here for about two hours already. <laughs> um, I was reading a bunch of stuff back in this library that they have over here. Um, and I'm slowly making my way through uh, the book that I have been coveting for a long time, uh, The Weather Reports You, which is uh, difficult and expensive to find a uh, copy. So I'm excited to sit down and read it. In fact, since there's nobody else here, I've been recording myself, reading excerpts of it so that I have it in the future and I can just kind of listen to it as an audio book. Even though I'm a chronic mumbler, I can understand me. But it's pretty incredible to be in here um, by myself. It's just this really exceptional experience of walking through these columns of water. Each one is about 50 gallons, which is like a tonnage of water. It's very heavy. Um, and each one of these columns was taken from um, ice collected from one of Iceland's uh, five major glaciers. And so each one has a different kind of mineral composition um, that was kind of floating in the ice. And that's kind of what creates this different color, brown and yellow kind of reflection on the bottom. It's all the sediment from the water settling at the bottom. Um, this insulation was uh, installed in 2007, uh, but it was a long, ongoing process, about three years in the making. Um, this space was once the community library. Um, but now there's a new, much larger library uh, down at the bottom of the hill. And so the space was designed to be an archive, um, an archive of water, an archive of responses to landscape and weather. Uh, so on the floor, you'll see too, there's all of these uh, words for the weather in both English and Icelandic. And uh, after riding through this weather for the last five days, um, my skin is like healing and I feel the effects of the weather. It's been like its own character in this, in this story of this trip. And uh, to see the different landscapes that the ice makes um, is pretty neat. I'd have to say one of my favorite samples, I wish I knew where it was from, is uh, it's this guy right here. It just kind of looks like we built Yellowstone National Park. And look at some of the areas around the geysers. Um, so I have this uh, on my Instagram. If you are interested in this project, I talk about it much more in detail there. I won't play the whole thing here because <laughs> I know that we're talking about bikes and not art, but I think that they're kind of, what was that uh, Robert Filou quote, which is uh, art is what makes life more interesting than art, um, which is actually why I'm leaving the field of art to become a therapist. Um, so 
after Library of Water, we popped on a ferry um, to kind of uh, get the experience of uh, arriving by water to the West Yards. So it's about a one hour ferry trip. Um, and this is the road on the other side of the ferry. Um, it was about uh, eight kilometers from the ferry to where we were setting up camp. Um, there's a couple of campgrounds next to this really lovely uh, hot pot. This is our campground here, um, actually in the backyard of a house that some people were restoring because all the other campgrounds and hostels in that very, very, very small town uh, were full. Uh, things just really um, book up very quickly in the summer. And uh, we ran into these uh, this uh, father and son who were doing some um, refurnishing on a house and uh, let us stay with them, which was very, very kind. Uh, this is the hot spring that was uh, just across the street. And so this pool looks out over onto the ocean. So you can kind of like sit in the hot pot and then get out and run into the ocean and take a cold plunge and then run back in. Um, just as long as you try to avoid the birds, uh, the, they're incredibly territorial during this time of year because uh, it's um, all their little babies are being born. Um, so this is also along the West Yards, um, just really interested in these like almost like sculptural looking abandoned like signage and houses and all of these things. Um, we ate a lot of this like weird meat stick situation, which is like this length of a jump rope. I think I actually ended up jump roping with it at one point. Um, but, you know, it's got a good amount of a uh, fat and calories and salt, which is all the things that you need while you're riding. Um, this is kind of our first leg of the West Yards, which is that little ginger root section sticking off the side. Uh, Everett, what are you doing? Uh, trying to fix my life. <laughs> uh, we were going through a construction zone earlier today, and uh, somehow I lost two chain ring bolts, these two. And so I ended up moving this one over to here. And then we did the last 30 miles, <laughs> just like with my fingers crossed. So, uh, it's hard to find a chicken bowl in these small towns. And so we're MacGyvering it right now. And we're just going to hope that this hole until we get to uh, East of Yoga. So we'll yeah. see. Uh, how do you feel about the fact that these zip ties are not your color palette? I'm fine with it. I think I need to, I need to branch out. <laughs> it's healthy. Uh, so Tessa is a very, uh, likes to wear lots of bright colors and um, always makes fun of me because I think everything I own is like green, black, brown, or gray. Uh, but yeah, this uh, chain ring bolt situation was wild. Um, I had actually just put on, I like, installed a new drivetrain before I left and I ratcheted down those uh, bolts. But we were going through this construction zone, which was construction on an unpaved road. It was literally them building a cliff uh, because it had just like washed the screen, like washed out. Um, so it was incredibly bumpy and bouldery and they must've just shook loose and shook loose. And uh, I ended up actually riding with those chain ring bolt zip ties for the next hundred miles, I think, uh, until we got to Isifjordur, which is the, uh, one of the only bike shops outside of Reykjavik in the country, um, run by a guy from Texas uh, named Tyler Wacker, uh, which is kind of funny. Uh, good guy, good guy. Um, this is part of the West Yards Way <laughs> section. And um, you have to go through this part of the route at low tide, otherwise um, the water is kind of like up to here, it would be like over my head in a couple of hours. So you have to kind of time that section just right um, so you can get through there. Um, this is Tessa crawling in another hole. She loves to climb on everything. Um, but yeah, some of the views off the side of the route are just like incredibly gorgeous. A lot of water crossings uh, in Iceland. So wherever you are, there's probably a river and you're probably going to have to either ride through it um, or walk your bike through it. Um, I had brought like separate um, seal skin socks and these like water grippy aqua socks to do river crossings. And I used them for a while for the sections that were just too big and wide to, um, to ride through. 
Um, but toward the end, it was just like such a pain to put them on and take them off each time. I just started taking my boots off. I ride Blundstones just because it's easy and I find them very comfortable. I just pop them off and just walk barefoot through. Um, even though it's cold, uh, it's only for a short time. Uh, so this is uh, also on the West Yards Way area. We found this glacial stream that was just like perfect bathing temperature. Um, this is also like 10 o'clock at night. We found this great waffle place. Another thing I love about the West Yards is you can find a waffle in any small town, small town being uh, two to three buildings um, or sometimes just one building. And uh, yeah, grab a waffle if you can, they're great. Um, we, uh, Tessa was a chef um, in a former, in a past life. And uh, so she always likes to bring a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables and things. So every time we got a chance to, uh, we'd grab a tomato uh, or some vegetables. We ate a lot of uh, caviar from a tube because uh, it's uh, harvested um, there from a lot of the um, salmon farms. And so if you're on a budget, which Iceland is very expensive to travel in and you uh, want to eat cheap rye bread and caviar, I'm telling you, it's like got a ton of fat, ton of calories, lots of salt, um, and it'll get you where you need to go. Lots of tinned fish, um, all kinds of good stuff. Uh, also lots of very cute lighthouses, which uh, Tessa was color matching every single time, which is always fun. We love a color matching moment. I love to see it. Uh, this is at the end of that kind of um, peninsula area that was in the last couple of slides. Our bikes got so muddy that we had to wash them off of the gas station. So uh, oftentimes in a lot of these places, similar to the US, um, in a lot of small towns, the only grocery stores that you'll be able to have access to are often gas stations. So instead of eating like gas station burritos like you would in the US, there's lots of gas station hot dogs. Apparently hot dogs are the official food of Iceland, which is funny. Um, and uh, this is uh, on our way to Isafjordur. We actually like lost the route. We're on it here, which um, there was a landslide. It kind of wiped out a big section of the route. And that's the roadway down there. But this very cute farm dog uh, came running up to us from the farm. And in the US, I'd be like, oh, God, no dog. Because um, usually they're coming to chase after you. I've had uh, dogs take out clients on bike tours in Tennessee and it's uh, pretty gnarly. But this dog was so friendly. He actually rode with us all the way to the top of the mountain, uh, literally for like two hours, just like up into the snowfall. And so um, that was a really, uh, <laughs> it was a really big climb. So I got very, very warm. My friend and I were just like biking in tank tops and shorts in the snow. Um, up on the top of the crossing, there's a big tunnel underneath us. So if you are in a car, you'd be driving through this like 20 minute long drive in a tunnel. So your options with a bike or if you're walking are just go up and over, um, which took us to Easy Fjordur and the Fjord Hub, which is the bicycle shop that's run by Tyler Wacker, who um, is part of the West Yards Way Challenge. If you've heard of that bike race that happens now every year, um, around the West Yards. Um, what Tessa and I did in about uh, two weeks, uh, people do as a race in like seven days. <laughs> um, we are not racers, at least especially not anymore. Um, after my injury, I really kind of like scaled back our mileage. Um, so we were really kind of like not taking it slow, not taking it easy, but just like going the pace that felt right for our bodies, which um, we've done a lot of riding independently. Um, but, uh, together we were kind of just decided to, you know, engage in some like mutual softness. Cause we're usually just like so hard on ourselves. Um, and it was nice to be able to just like take the time we needed. I was able to go into the, um, hot pots every day, which was really great for my chronic pain, um, and my lower back for my injury. This is the a uh, harbor that the bike shop is in. It's like best view of any bike shop I've ever been to. Um, just a really, really lovely harbor town. Um, and then this is the rest of the West Yards Way over here on the left is um, the biggest hot spring in Iceland, um, like the biggest hot pool rather, like constructed hot pool. 
Um, and it's at this old salt factory. Um, and it used to be part of the salt making process at that factory. It's like this very like brutalist looking Prussian concrete building. Um, and then sheep, just lots of sheep everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. I miss them. Um, this is our first like major like summit crossing. Um, and there are these spools that were kind of the only thing to kind of seek shelter behind. Um, it got really, really windy again, and we kind of ended up taking about 11 hours to go 40 miles. Um, it's the longest time it's taken for me to do that kind of distance. It was pretty brutal, um, but we made it. We linked up with a photographer, Whit Hassett, who followed us for the rest of the Witch of the West Yard section. So the factory is an old abandoned heron factory. Um, that this couple, this family took over and they built hotels and they do this uh, art exhibition inside of this like abandoned factory, um, more on the West Yards way, heading out on the Witch of the West. It's named that because of all of the witchcraft references, um, more of a salty, delicious fish food. Uh, then we get to the North. There's a lot of really interesting geological features in the north, lots of really neat hot pools. Uh, laundry day, if you've ever done this trip, uh, it's uh, one of my favorite trip hacks is uh, you wear your rain jacket as a skirt and wind jacket as a top and wash everything else. <laughs> um, it feels a little silly, but honestly, it feels fashion as well. Um, Getting to the north, um, we're about to get on a ferry to uh, Dalvik, which is up in the Arctic Circle. Um, some of the worst pizza I've ever had, uh, we got the night before, and uh, I took it with me as breakfast to get on the ferry. Um, I highly recommend to not eat day-old uh, pizza with ground beef on it before going on a really, really bumpy ferry ride for three hours. Um, uh, about half the people on the ferry ended up, uh, instead of taking the ferry back, uh, flew back to Akhmeti, which I think is really funny. But this is the island we were headed to up in the Arctic Circle. It was my birthday, so I wanted to spend it with puffins and this weird um, concrete ball that gets rolled around, um, around the equatorial line of the Arctic Circle. Um, so it kind of moves around over time and creates this pathway on the northern side of the island. Um, so our little puffin friends who are just super cute, we were invited to this uh, nice small local bonfire that looks like it should be in like a Nordic metal music video. Um, it was just the town getting together and just an excuse to hang out with each other um, and burn a boat apparently. Um, this is in Akureyri. Uh, I was visiting my aunt and some family there, a fun hot springs that was also inside of a boat. And we are on the divide. This is what seven days of food looks like. <laughs> um, luckily, we had plenty of water. We didn't really know what would be up there. There are a few kind of um, outpost stations, um, but no really reliable food sources. So we brought everything. This is just my food for seven days. Um, we ended up doing that section in five instead of seven. Um, but the first day we rode out basically as far as we could ride that still had grass so we could camp for the first night. So we were out of the boulder. Um, lots of beautiful moss. There she is again. Um, but once you actually get up to the top of the plateau, it looks like the moon. Um, it's just you and black rock and these like glaciers where you can't really tell what is the sky and what is ice. It's pretty fabulous. Um, there's a lot of really random activity that happens up there and still lots of like tourist activity up on the plateau still. So you'll see these buses that go around these like wild corners. Um, it seems pretty sketchy to me. <laughs> um, also, there's a lot of damming for electricity. Um, there's a lot of people who talk about Iceland having a lot of hydroelectric energy. This is true in terms of um, city centers using the heat for power, but a lot of it comes from uh, damming the water flow from the glaciers, um, which is a topic for another day, but I could talk a lot about that. You can see kind of the difference between the reservoir water, which is this brown murky water and this just blue turquoise water that's uh, coming into the reservoir. It's just kind of shocking to see that. Um, this is 
on our way to Lama Nalega, um, which is this section um, right on the divide that has these hot springs rivers. I didn't take too many photos of actual hot springs just because there's a lot of um, skin and I wanted to be respectful of people's privacy. Um, but this is up in the middle of the plateau at this place called the Mountain Mall in La Manalega, and it's these like three buses that drive up there every spring. They stay for the summer and then they drive back in the fall and they just kind of like set up this like outdoor market. So there's a restaurant, um, coffee shop and a grocery store out there. So that was uh, that was a treat. This is also coming off of La Manalega. Um, I'm realizing it's getting uh, well into the hour, so I'll kind of speed through some of these um, more amazing geological features, uh, lots of horses, <laughs> and uh, uh, naps out in the tundra. So this is in the south now. Um, Tessa is sitting on top of a piece of uh, a old bridge that got blown away during a, a water break when a gl glacial melt kind of broke through and wiped out that whole area. Um, this nice climbing hut that some local climbers let us stay at because all the camping was just a madhouse. Uh, the South is super, 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 super busy um, because it looks like this, it's gorgeous. Um, some more coming out of the South, again, our friend N1, uh, I went to pump up my tire and actually just exploded it completely off its rim. Um, and then we finally make our way all the way to the east. Um, and in the east, we ended up in Sedis Fjodor, which is the further most eastern town. Um, that's also where the ferry is. So you can take the ferry to Denmark from here um, and also the Faroe Islands. So uh, it was here too. This is the boat that takes you to the Faroe Islands in Denmark. Uh, we ended up getting there a couple of days early. And so we found these people sorting groceries. Apparently, um, there's this local food co-op that imports groceries from Denmark and then distributes them. Um, farms in Denmark distributes them around um, Iceland. And they had a bum shipment, so we were helping them sort stuff out. And they ended up just asking us to work for them for two days. So we got free food and produce for the next couple of days, which is great. So uh, I just wanted to say it, it is five of, um, yeah. every, we want to hear your whole presentation. So we're going to stay on. And I just want to let everybody know that this is actually being recorded. So if you do have to leave, you can check out the recording later and, but you can stay on. I, we, we still want to do like Q and A and everything. So Everett, don't feel like you have to rush. We're really into this. So we want to see all of it. <laughs> so all right. you I, can give us, Everett, it's great. Like I said, I was putting this together and I totally realized that I hadn't looked at any of these photos since I got back in October. So, um, there's only a few left and thanks for folks who want to stay on. Um, I'm happy to answer some questions as well. Um, but this is basically the end. We ended up taking the ferry to the Faroe Islands for um, about a week. And then instead of going on to Germany, I decided to come back to Iceland. Uh, you can pop on a plane, just roll your bike right on and right off the plane, just bike to the uh, airport. It's kind of amazing. So I went back to East of Fjordur, um, to do some surfing and to work with the Visit West Fjords folks um, on developing a tour, a guided tour out there. Um, this is what they do in the shoulder seasons as they're trying to incorporate surfing lessons uh, into their bike rental stuff in Nisa Fjordur. Um, but when you're tired of surfing, you can just sit in a glacial river in your wetsuit. It's always fun. Um, yeah, so this is kind of um, the end of images at least. And uh, yeah, if folks have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Sorry, I was just kind of like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I thank you for your patience. Uh, that was so incredible, Everett. Thank you so much. So yeah, if anyone has any questions, um, you can pop it into chat. Um, we're kind of moderating that. Oh, great. Um, are there any questions right out of the gate? Okay. Um, excellent. So did you have any questions you wanted to? Yeah. I so ever you've done this trip sounded like there was some there was a lot of awesomeness in fact other than a couple of like bad lucks it sounds like the whole trip was perfect so is there anything that you would recommend someone do if they only had a week like what's the you got to go this is one week I, I can that's all the time i can afford absolutely um actually my my route that i put together is like all taken from routes that you can do in like 7 to 10 days and all of those routes can be modified as well um 
And if folks are interested in putting together a new loop, um, I, I have lots of recommendations um, that I can send on Ride with GPS. But um, the West Yards way is just really incredible. Um, it's great if you are not a super technical rider, but you want to do some mixed terrain. Um, I rode a mountain bike. You don't need to ride a mountain bike, but um, because of my injury, I was just trying to get as much soft squish as I could. Um, and it really helped for the divide sections as well. Um, there's also a bunch of different ways that you can do the divide. The section that we ended up doing, uh, you can do in five days. And so you can fly into Reykjavik uh, or fly into, um, well, the airport that's actually not in Reykjavik at all. Um, and fly to Akureyri and then bike the divide and then just uh, hop on a bus back to the airport. So that's a nice fun in and out. You can also fly to Isifjordur and back. I think um, with your bike even, it's like about $100 for round trip tickets to Isifjordur from Reykjavik. So it's actually cheaper than the bus. Um, but yeah, I highly recommend all of those. They're really delightful. And I wanted to know, um, do you have any other big adventures planned? Uh, aside from life? <laughs> um, well, bikey adventures, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I would like to do the Oregon Timber Trail again. Um, like I mentioned before, I just joined the board and I raced the Timber Trail back in 2021 and had such a great time. But there were sections of it that were closed because of all of the fire activity. Um, and I met some other riders during that trip. I went there not knowing anybody and it was a grand apart. So like start off as like 50 strangers and then you're like besties at the end. It's always fun. It's like summer camp for adults. Um, and so I want to go back and do the Timber Trail again, or at least different sections of it. Um, and I'm going to be, as a Bikepacking Roots community ambassador, I'm going to be um, leading a couple of small overnights, like out in Oak Ridge, which is a section of it. Um, but I'm also putting together a route, uh, also in Iceland, with a friend of mine, Mac, um, uh, to uh, this place called Vidi, which in Icelandic means hell. And so we're calling it uh, to hell and back. <laughs> and uh, it's it's very similar um, geologically to the, the divide section, um, except for it starts in the east in Igelstadr and goes out past all these like thermal rivers and um, volcanoes. And uh, we're excited to kind of test that out, hopefully this summer. Um, but I'm currently waiting to hear back about some programs for going back to school. Um, so we'll see how that turns out. Ever, we have a question from Todd. And as a as an aside here, Todd's actually going to be a guest with us in a couple of months as well to talk about his adventure. His question is, well, first of all, he's fascinated by how you put something like this all together. What kind of life do you envision for your material following the trip itself? Could you talk a little bit about the relationship between conceiving of and planning a trip and finding support and context for it beyond the trip itself? That is such an excellent question. Thank you, Todd. Um, so uh, this trip actually, because it was um, partially sponsored trip, um, I was doing a lot of video, like these photos, sorry, I was like, so many photos, blinding amount of photos. Um, I have so much content and that's because um, we're putting together a short film with We Got Next. Uh, so Whit Hassett, who joined us for a section of the route, um, is a filmmaker. And so she joined us for some sections of it with a drone to get some aerial shots and things like that. And between her footage and my footage, we're going to put together kind of like a short film um, about the trip itself. Um, they'll have a lot more of that. And hopefully the plan is um, that we're going to be with some of the other folks who are part of the program. So we have someone who canoed to um, the Arctic Circle through Canada, through the Canadian tundra and like people who uh, like backpacked across Croatia and things like that. And so we'll all be kind of traveling as a group um, talking about those things. And in terms of support, um, I've been doing this for such a long time that I feel really uh, grateful to have access to uh, the people that I have access to in terms of like asking lots of questions and favors. Um, my bike is actually put together completely of like donated parts or secondhand parts from friends. And so um, I feel really supported in these projects in terms of like both information and resources um, and feel very lucky for that. 
um, yeah, and in terms of beyond the trip itself, I mean, I have this like secret dream, not so secret dream, because I'm telling you um, about really thinking about the somatic relationship between um, mental health and cycling, um, going back to school um, for uh, to become a counselor and really kind of want to work with uh, people in the outdoors, specifically in a more structured format someday. Great. Well, um, yeah. yeah. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you, Everett, so much. This was an extremely well-polished presentation of your adventure and really interesting. Loved all the culture and art that you brought into it. We, uh, we have, so for everyone listening, like our next webinar, which is also going to be really interesting in a very different way, is about bike fit and physical therapy as it relates to people on bicycles. We're doing that Wednesday, January 10th. You're always welcome to join. Everett, you too. And actually one last thing is Everett, if people wanted to follow along with your adventures, um, do you have any social media platforms that you'd like to share? Sure. Um, as of right now, um, I am on Instagram. Um, I'm mostly only really posting stories at this moment, um, but hope to be picking it up again. So there's a lot of stuff about this trip that's over on there right now. Uh, you want to check it out. It's uh, mm -hmm. Grandpa Everett, at Grandpa Everett. Yeah, well, we can add a link too as well because um, we're going to put this recording on our website as well so people can come back and check this out. Great. Thank you so much, Everett, and good luck with school. Thank you. Thank you. Have a beautiful rest of your day. Thanks. Good to see you.